Today is an interview that I've been looking forward to for a very long time. This is Dr. Gary Fraser. He's board certified in internal medicine and cardiovascular medicine, presently the professor of cardiology at Loma Linda University School of Medicine and professor of epidemiology at the School of Public Health in Loma Linda. Dr. Fraser is the author or co-author of more than 100 scientific publications in peer-reviewed journals. He's the author of two books. One's called Preventative Cardiology, and the other is called Diet, Life Expectancy, and Chronic Disease. Both of those books are published by Oxford University Press. And currently, he's the principal investigator of a study called Cancer Epidemiology in Adventists a low risk group. And this study will be following the incidence of breast, colon and prostate cancer and death among 96,000 people, Adventists, over a 10 year period. Now, the reason I'm so excited to talk to Dr. Fraser is because if you've followed me for a while, if you've read uh, Crispy Cancer, my first book, then you may be aware, or if you've read the work uh, of Dan Butner in the Blue Zones, you may be aware that the Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Linda, California, are uh, that area is considered a blue zone. They are the longest living Americans. And Dr. Fraser is studying these people. <laughs> so there's a lot of insight and there's a lot of research that's already been done following the Adventists for many decades. And we're going to dig into all of that science and, and really give you the, the, the big takeaways of what they're doing right to decrease the risk of chronic disease and increase their lifespan. So that's my intro. Dr. Fraser, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Pleasure. So can we start with your story? How did you get into health and nutrition epidemiology? Uh, well, simply really, um, I count myself so fortunate that I was born here in New Zealand, actually, where I'm currently at, uh, into an Adventist family, which meant that, um, among other things, that I had kind of a built-in interest in nutrition and good living, uh, healthy living, and so forth. And um, But as I went forward and uh, got into my medical education, uh, I discovered along the way that I quite liked math and found statistics. Um, Pretty fascinating. So the question came in my residency thinking forward, how was one best to combine medicine and math? And the answer is clearly epidemiology. And uh, to become a nutritional epidemiologist was quite natural for me because I'd always had some kind of interest in, if you like, trying to validate some of the things I'd been brought up to adhere to um, where there wasn't much of a scientific base at that time. And so that, that's in a way what brought me into it. And along with that was a realization as a, um, a young resident that many, many things appeared to be lifestyle related, many chronic disorders, and that to some extent, you know, we were trying to shut the door of the barn after the horse had already bolted, as they say. And uh, certainly we can do important things as physicians but we generally can't restore back to the situation if they had never ever developed the problem in the first place. So the Seventh Day Adventists place a high value on nutrition and and health and wellness practices. Correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, and I, I think you've said it exactly right. We we place a value on that. We um, view our bodies uh, as a gift. And uh, I have a responsibility to treat those well and look after them. I read, and I think this might have been in one of the AHS2 Adventist Health Study uh, findings, what that somewhere around 80% of Adventists are vegetarian. Is that right? Or is it higher? No, no, it's actually lower. Uh, okay. At least in our studies, it's more like 50%. And it depends oh. a, a little bit, you know, how you define this, of course. What do we mean by vegetarian? And we probably need to come into that. But in our studies, it's about 50% in the way we define it. And to some extent, 
that's why I have lived my professional life in California, really, where um, I had really no thoughts of doing that when I graduated from medical school, because the Adventist population, particularly in the United States, presents an unparalleled opportunity to good, do good epidemiologic work and nutrition, simply because you've got this large group of people who really don't smoke and most don't consume alcohol, uh, which are kind of confounding, confusing factors in, in all of this. And about Why half of them are vegetarian and half of them are not. And so you've got the opportunity to compare very different dietary habits, controlling for a bunch of other stuff in a way, um, and look at outcomes. How, how, why do you say that um, not smoking and drinking is confounding or confusing? Well, um, you know, if it turned out that the people who were, say, meat eaters, who are Adventists, tended to be more uh, smokers, if Adventists were smokers, um, then you have the confusing factor, is it their meat or is it their smoking? Got it. And, and, and you know, the, this is the kind of thing that pervades observational epidemiology. You think you're studying one thing, but are you studying something else that's closely related to it? And you've got to think carefully about all of that and put all the factors you can think of into the statistical model and adjust for them. Right. So for anyone that isn't familiar with statistics and how studies work, right? It's people have lots of habits, diet and lifestyle habits, and all those habits play a part in their life and their health. And uh, if, if you're too, if your focus is too micro <laughs> and you're not looking at the big picture, then you might draw a correlation between someone's lifestyle habit and their disease that really doesn't exist, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the the, the the classic example of that, if you studied uh, whether or not a person owned a cigarette lighter, you would find it was closely related to lung cancer. And you might draw conclusions, but uh, having people discard those cigarette lighters wouldn't do anything to the risk of lung cancer. Yeah, you're much more likely to own a cigarette lighter <laughs> if you smoke cigarettes. <laughs> or the number of cigarette lighters could be correlated with uh, lung cancer as well. Yeah, that's a great example. So how did the first Adventist uh, study come, come together, the Adventist mortality study? That started uh, in 1960? 1958. Um, and it was, uh, again, a nationally funded study from the U.S. Public Health Service at that time. And really was a collaboration with the American Cancer Society study that was going on. And uh, I can tell you that there was a little bit of controversy amongst the church administrators, the idea of putting a uh, kind of, quotes, religious response to a scientific statistical test was something that was a bit new for a religionist, you know. And um, to their credit, they decided after discussion that if they really believed this, they should put it to the test. And um, actually, things have worked out pretty well in that regard as far as uh, the church, although perhaps not 100% uh, in the way that uh, they might have expected. And so at that time, when they, when they first started this study, uh, which became a series of studies, were they already experiencing a lower rate of heart disease? I mean, was there already chatter that, hey, we're, we're not seeing the same rates of heart disease. We're not seeing the same rates of cancer. We think it's our diet and lifestyle. Were those conversations happening before the study started? I don't think so. I mean, it was a little before my time, or at least I was only 10 or 12, um, was not involved. But I think I'm right in saying that that first study was begun uh, more than anything else to investigate the risk of cigarette smoking on cancer. The idea being that there was this big American Cancer Society study going nationwide at the same time to look at that question. And this was around the time just soon after the important doctors smoking study from the UK had been reported that suggested strongly that cigarette smoking was related to risk of lung cancer. And so here was a population, someone realized uh, none of them were smokers. And so the idea was to have a look and see was there a you know, much lower rate of lung cancer. But of course, it turned out once we started to measure diet and we were looking at mortality, that we looked at a whole bunch of other stuff. And yes, 
even in that earlier study, we found that the Adventists were living substantially longer than other people and had lower rates, particularly the men, not so much the women, in uh, coronary heart disease risk, for instance. So I want to talk about some of those specific findings from the first mortality study. Uh, the Adventist men lived 6.2 years longer than the non-Adventist men in the American Cancer Society study. Women were almost four years longer in their lifespan, but the death rates were really the big story because the death rate from all cancers was 40% lower for the Adventist men, 24% lower for the women. Now, I imagine that discrepancy was because uh, the non-Adventist men were probably more aggressive drinkers and smokers out there. <laughs> Right? So they probably had a higher rate of cancer than the non-Adventist women at the time. I that, think that, that's right. That, yeah. that's a, it, and, you know, even a study I did um, or just 20 years or so ago, actually, <clears throat> when I was at University of Cambridge in the UK, suggested that the British men, not Adventists, were um, less likely to adhere to a healthy diet than the British woman. Yes, um, right. Uh, and, Men seem to have these uh, more flexible attitudes, should we say. More, yeah, proclivity towards self-destruction. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, women have women are generally healthier. That's why you don't see as big a benefit because they're already generally healthier than their, their male counterparts. But, okay, so continuing, the lung cancer rate, 70, sorry, lung cancer death, 79% lower, which you mentioned, very few to no smokers. Colorectal cancer, 38% lower. Breast cancer, 15% lower. And then coronary heart disease, 30%, 34% lower for men. And so I mean, those were big findings. So, and they were at the time. And that really spurred on uh, um, further investigations so that the Adventist Health Study 1 was funded in the 1970s, really. Um, and uh, that study gave a lot more attention to diet because the first study, the mortality study, which was about 22,000 uh, Adventists in California, uh, the second study, Adventist Health Study 1, was about 34,000 Adventists in California. They were all in California. And that gave much more attention to diet. And that was a study comparing one kind of Adventist to another kind of Adventist, whereas the mortality study was largely comparing Adventists as a group to non-Adventists as a group. So a little different there. Uh, although having said that, makes sense, also, right? They wanted yeah. to dig in. So they, they, they came up with this data. Okay, the Adventists have much lower rates of cancer, death, of, death from cancers, different cancers than non-Adventists. Now let's study the Adventists themselves and their diet and lifestyle habits and try to parse out what are they doing right? What are the healthiest Adventists doing versus those that aren't as healthy? And let's try to figure out what is, I mean, and this is the kind of study that I think is so terrific. I mean, it's, these studies are not based on speculation. They're not based on fantasy. They're not, uh, what you see a lot of times in the health and wellness world is you see influencers and doctors and uh, whoever, uh, espousing theoretical information about what our ancestral health, that's the big buzzword, ancestral health. You want to be healthy, then you need to eat like your ancestors. Well, we don't even know if our ancestors were healthy, right? Like, I have no idea if my ancestors were healthy. So it's on. It's based on this presupposition that your ancestors were all lived long, healthy, disease-free lives, and they were cavemen, and all they ate was like bison. And so to me, that, that type of, quote, science is highly speculative, highly dubious. And I, I personally prefer studying real life people who are alive right now and looking at what they're doing. I, mean, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, this ancestral stuff, I mean, the, as far as we know, people were probably only living largely to their mid-30s anyhow. So what's relevant there because most of the things that we are studying now could be considered diseases of aging. Um, the other point that I would make is that there's a lot of hype many times about how health habits might change a laboratory value or 
uh, a, a clinical point of information. Um, and that, that's relevant. I mean, that's not crazy research, but it's not enough because the, the intact body has so many compensating mechanisms that even though you can get clues by seeing that people who live this way have this biochemical characteristic or that, uh, you've really got to put it together and study the whole organism, which is what we like to do in fairly traditional epidemiology. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, th that that makes a lot of sense to me. So in the first, the, the Adventist Health Study 1, which was the second study on the Adventists, what were some of the, the findings there? Um, well, uh, this is where we first really got into nutrition as such, even though by today's standards, the way we measured it was probably less than ideal. But at the time, it was, uh, it was a, a good study, a groundbreaking study. Uh, we again found that um, total mortality rates were lower, and we were able to do a, uh, a little bit clearer evaluation of that in terms of life expectancy, adjusting for certain factors. Again, it was a study in California, and but the results were really quite similar to those that you've just mentioned from the, the older study in many ways. The men were living about seven years, seven and a bit years longer than their non-Adventist male neighbors, and the woman about four and a half years longer. And this was based on thousands of deaths. So it, you know, it wasn't chance. The the p values, as we talk about, the the probability that this would have arisen just by chance was minute. You know, one in a million type of thing. Um, and so something important was going on. And moreover, if we looked at that subset of Adventists who were um, vegetarian, they exercised regularly, they ate. Uh, modest quantity of nuts, um, and they were careful of their body weight and so forth. Um, they, they were uh, an unusual group and a small group because, you know, most Adventists, even though they do many good things, they're, they're not living perfectly by any means. Um, but this, but these were the, this was the health nut segment of yeah, the Adventists. Yeah, exactly. Adventist, right? they, they, also they were living, regular they were living exercise. 10, 10 plus years longer than uh, the Adventists who did everything wrong. And, you know, I sometimes say some kind of, kind of tongue-in-cheek to some extent that as an epidemiologist, I'm grateful for the obese, non-exercising, hamburger-eating Adventists that do exist because this is the science of comparisons and we need that group to make the comparison to see just what good choices, what uh, distinctions they actually make in terms of people's health. I understand. So that, that is that is really interesting. So the, the absolute healthiest uh, segment of Adventists had a, a 10 year life expect 10 years of extra life expectancy versus the unhealthiest in your studies or in the in AHS one. Yeah, yes, that's that's correct. Um, and this was in California. So so that was one major finding that got a lot of press. Uh, another one was that we were actually the first study to show that regular consumption four or five times a week of small to modest quantities of nuts uh, seemed to give a 40 to 50 percent protection against heart attack. And uh, that was pretty, pretty controversial for a start. And there was an editorial that came out accompanying it that was highly skeptical. <laughs> and um, but then subsequently, uh, you know, many other studies have found the same thing. We've done, uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Sabate, and uh, myself, but particularly him, a lot of feeding studies to see uh, does nut consumption for short periods of time affect blood lipids, for instance, and it does in a favorable way. So we have some idea of mechanisms there, and uh, you know now the American Heart Association suggests that is a healthy thing to do. Uh, so that was another major finding. Um, we found that um, colorectal cancer was uh, reduced in our meat, uh, non-meat eaters uh, as compared to those that, that have red meat, which is uh, no surprise. Um, and we also started to look at the health of vegetarians as compared to non-vegetarian Adventists in general. That was really a focus 
that came to play most importantly in Adventist Health Study 2, which was a national study. So, and I want to, I want to dig into to the second study, the AHS-2, but there's a few other uh, key findings from AHS-1 that I pulled up that I want to mention because they're just so fascinating. So reduced consumption of red and white meat uh, was associated with a decreased risk of colon cancer. Eating legumes, that's beans, was protective against colon cancer. We know why. One of the reasons why is because of phytic acid is an anti-cancer compound that's in legumes. And when you eat starch, it produces butyrate in the colon, which is an Mm anti-cancer compound. Uh, Eating nuts several times a week reduced the risk of heart attack by up to 50%, which you mentioned. Eating whole grain bread instead of white bread reduced non-fatal heart attack risk by 45%. Drinking five or more glasses of water a day reduced uh, may reduce heart disease by 50%. That's pretty interesting, just water. And then uh, men who had a high consumption of tomatoes and also drinking soy milk had significant reduction in prostate cancer risk. 40% risk Mm -hmm. if you eat lots of tomatoes, 70% risk if if you drink soy milk once daily, once or more per day. And a lot of people really get triggered when I say, when, when they hear the word soy, because there's been so much misinformation about soy and so much fear mongering about soy. People think soy has estrogen and it raises your estrogen and it's really unhealthy, but soy actually has phytoestrogens, which are similar to estrogen, but they're not harmful. They're actually beneficial to the body and also anti-cancer um, protein, um, genistein and uh, isoflavones. And soy's got lots of good stuff in it, right? Well, um, yes, I think it does. But let me walk you back a little bit on that. We've we've always got to remember that these are observation studies. Um, The philosophy behind an observation study like this is that we, if we perfectly adjust for all these confounding variables, we should get the same result as a clinical trial, a randomized clinical trial. So that's always the goal. But we don't always make that. And I did mention that in Adventist Health Study 1, our dietary methods were not really up to the standard that we would uh, insist on today. They were good at the time. Um, And, for instance, um, there are a couple of those results you mentioned that I choose not to emphasize. Um, okay. Which although, ones? Although, although most of them that you mentioned, um, you know, the legumes and colorectal cancer, the red meats, particularly in colorectal cancer, um, yeah, they, they make sense and I think they hold up. But um, I don't emphasize the water and heart attack in men. We did not see it in women. Um, the mechanism is not entirely clear. The p-values were not all that strong. I really would like to see that duplicated, let me put it that way, before I made a big thing of it. But the one result that I think was probably wrong, and we've now corrected it um, about a year ago from Adventist Health Study 2, is actually the soy and prostate cancer, interestingly. Uh, if you if you look at the uh, data in Adventist Health Study 1, that was based on only two or three cases that turned out to still be statistically significant, but really not a very robust result in the heavy drinking soy milk users. Back at that time, back in the 70s, Soy milk was pretty horrible stuff. They they didn't know know how to use it. You had to be highly motivated. And there weren't too many even of our group that were drinking soy. But what we came to realize was that these are always substitutionary hypotheses. If you drink a lot of soy milk, it means you're not drinking something else, probably. Or there's some substitution. Yeah. And in our new study, and we published this about a year ago, and it turns out we've got almost identical results for breast and prostate cancer, which is interesting, two hormone-related cancers. We found that dairy milk consumption appeared to quite dramatically increase the risk of both of these cancers, including prostate cancer. 
And the, so then the question arises, is the risk, the presence of the dairy milk or the absence of the soy milk that the people that are drinking dairy don't use soy or the other way around, you know? And so the, uh, the way to sort that out, of course, is to put both of these milks in the same equation so that you're essentially adjusting for one and able to look at each of them in isolation independently. And when we did that, to our surprise, the dairy milk held firm as a hazardous relationship and the protective effect of the soy milk largely disappeared. Um, that's, that's really interesting. And I'm so glad you we dug into this because mm -hmm. so obviously the information on Adventist Health One is still out there. I mean, I'm reading it, you know, from... Yes. You know, yes. which people might stumble across and read and, and they, they read the conclusions and they think, oh, it's soy milk is the, is the reason. But turns out the people who are drinking soy milk were not drinking dairy. So it was the not drinking dairy that was more important to their health than the actual soy milk itself in terms of preventing prostate cancer. It's what we think at the moment. And, uh, you know, we may want to go a little deeper into this as we talk about Adventist Health Study too, because there's some pretty interesting um, uh, aspects to this relationship. But yeah, please. So so Adventist Health Study 2 started in 2002. Yes. And, and this was 125,000 Adventists. Well, that was the goal. We actually ended up enrolling 96,000 with the uh, the resources that we had available. Got it. Mm -hmm. And this was uh, right across the United States. Uh, we uh, attempted to make a significant minority population be the African Americans, and about 25, 26,000 of those 96,000 indeed were uh, Black Adventists some from the uh, Caribbean, but living in the United States. Um, so this turned out to be a pretty good study, I believe. Uh, we gave a tremendous amount of attention to the best possible methods. Um, we had, uh, it was a 50-page questionnaire. So you imagine we we convinced 96,000 people to fill out a 50-page questionnaire. Those, 50 those pages, that's a, yeah, that's a small book. <laughs> And um, so our data set is pretty large. And we also had what we call a calibration study. We took a random thousand of those. And I don't want to go too much into uh, details in specific, but I think you can get the idea because everyone knows that with a food frequency questionnaire, when you ask people about a whole list of different foods and say, how often do you eat this uh, thinking on the last one year? How often do we eat carrots? Well, is it three times a week or is it two and a half or is it four? You know, um, it's a little hard to evaluate that, but you get some idea. Um, but there are obviously substantial errors in the way that people give us their very best information that they can come up with about their diets. Just diets are so complicated. So many foods and you change things as they become available or not, or whatever. Um, so we had this subset of a thousand people that we put a lot of resources in to really establishing their diet with some accuracy. They gave us six 24 hour detailed recalls on the telephone telling us what they had eaten in the last 24 hours once we contacted them. And we didn't warn them ahead of time. So they weren't specially not eating the chocolate cake and all these things. Um, and uh, we believe that people were reported fairly accurately. So then we were able to establish a relationship between, say, fat as measured in our food frequency questionnaire and fat as measured in these 20 repeated 24-hour recalls, six of them, in the same people. We could establish that relationship and we could apply it then to the whole cohort. So this is a set of strategy called regression calibration, which is well-described. Not many studies have used it. They haven't had this calibration study that we had. But um, the advantage is that it nearly always increases the strength of the relationship because the uh, effect of these errors in diet that are inevitable when people do their best even to tell us is to weaken the apparent effects, drives it down even if there is a strong effect of fat against 
some heart disease or whatever, it'll make it look as if there's nothing much going on. That's what the errors do. So we could at least substantially unpack that by using this regression calibration approach. So we gave a lot of attention to, to, to methods and the best methods available, I guess, is what I'm, what I'm trying to tell you. AHS2, what was the purpose of it? Was it, was it motivated by the, resu- the results of the first study, the first two studies, right? Uh, but then to get even more granular and more precise yeah, it was definitely motivated by the results of AHS1 and the recognition that they looked like there was some interesting things going on there, but we needed to get more precise dietary data and also the confidence intervals that we were able to report in AHS1 were wider than ideal. We wanted more precision, which means we needed a bigger study, a more representative study, so that's why we went to the whole country and uh, we've got a study which was, uh, you know, three times as large. Um, but we were addressing some of the same questions, really, except that because of the better uh, granularity and precision in our data, we were able to look much, much more clearly at different kinds of vegetarians, which we hadn't really done in AHS1. So we had vegans and we had lacto-over vegetarians and we had pesco vegetarians, people that only ate fish. And we compared that against the 50% of our population that were non-vegetarians. And by that, we meant they ate uh, red or white meats at least once a week. And in fact, most of them were relatively low uh, meat-eating non-vegetarians. So when we compared our vegetarians to our non-vegetarians, it was a pretty hard comparison, actually, because our non-vegetarians were not like their neighbors, you know, eating red meats three, four, five times a week. We had very, very few that were in that way. Um, So anyhow, we were able to look very carefully at these different kinds of vegetarians. And um, I mean, it's almost, um, sometimes it seems barely believable that almost everything you look at, that the the one group was doing better. Um, and I'm sure that it's not actually true for everything. But when we look, for instance, at the risk of diabetes, the risk of high blood pressure, uh, the risk of even being overweight or obese, we found it was just like a, a ladder moving up. The vegans were down here, then the lactose, then the pescos, then the non-vegetarians. And these were very highly statistically significant results. So and the lactose... Just so, just for folks that don't know the terminology, yes. vegan is a person who doesn't eat any animal product. And maybe they have honey. I don't know if that was a factor in your study, but they're definitely not eating meat, animal protein, and they're not eating eggs or dairy, butter, cheese, milk, right? That's the vegan yes. in your study. That's correct. The, the lacto, yeah. they're, they're consuming dairy. So they're having milk, eggs, and and uh, and cheese, but no animal flesh. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yes. And then the pesco ovo, they're having eggs, dairy, and fish. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. But no, no chickens, no pigs, no cows. Got it. No land animals, basically. And then yes. the next step up was just people that ate what everything. That's right. And uh, including red and white meats at least once a week. At least once a week. Okay. Yeah. And and, one thing that we felt forced to do, which some purists don't think we did it quite right, is that we called someone a vegan, even if they ate, you know, our lowest category was not zero. It was less than once a month. Got it. Um, Less than once a month. Yeah, which is pretty low. That means they're only eating maybe six eight, six to eight, maybe six to nine servings a year of, something. of, yeah. of meat, of animal protein. That, that's right. And the vast majority of those people were zero. Got it. Yeah. yeah. And so in that group, that, so let's talk about that group had, had superior health uh, outcomes in, in what, what categories, what diseases? Okay, uh, so you're talking about vegans now, or you the want vegans, the, the, he- yeah, the, the healthiest, the people eating the least amount of animal food? Yes, well, you know, um, 
one is almost tempted to say, as you just kind of did then, the healthiest, but that may not be quite right. Okay. Um, the, the, the vegans were clearly doing best in diabetes, hypertension, their body weight, their average BMI was about 23.6, whereas the average BMI for our non-vegetarians, remember these are all adverse, was 28.6. Which is and overweight, so almost obese. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. And even our lactose on average were about 25.5. And that's pushing almost overweight. If you're over 25, you're overweight. That's correct. Generally. Um, yeah. So, so all these things were true. We looked at uh, CRP, which is a measure of inflammation in the blood that was lowest in the vegans. We looked at insulin levels. Uh, they were lowest in the vegans, implying better sensitivity to insulin, which all kind of makes sense. We looked at blood lipid levels. The LDLs were lowest in the vegans and the lactose as compared to the non-vegetarians. So all these things were true. The other two things that we found that the vegans seem to do best and interestingly were prostate and breast cancer. And I'd like to come back to that, but just kind of reporting that. But having said that about the vegans, um, if you put all the vegetarians together, the vegans, the lactose, lactose and the pescos, as a group, they were doing better than the non-vegetarians in almost uh, in most things that we could measure. Not all, certainly all of cardiovascular disease, um, and some of the cancers, and in terms of life expectancy. No question about that. The vegetarians as a group. When you dig deeper into the different sorts of vegetarians, things became more complicated, and um, particularly with respect to cancer and maybe total mortality. Uh, the vegans were, let's talk about total mortality. As a group, the vegetarians were doing better. They had about a 15% reduction in total mortality, which may not sound great, uh, a great amount, but it's actually very hard to demonstrate differences in total mortality. Um, it seems like there's kind of a fairly hard upper end point to how long people are going to live. And we found that, you know, a lot of our deaths are in the 80s and 90s. Um, and it was pretty hard to move that much further. And even our non-vegetarians as such were pretty healthy people um, by and large. But we found this, this difference. But we didn't find the vegans were doing best. Uh, we've looked at it several times, and the group is doing best, interestingly, over PESCO vegetarians. They've got a nearly 20% reduction. Um, and, and then comes fish. a little bit of fish. Yeah. yeah, a little bit of fish. And then the lactose and the and the vegans are about together. The lactose may be a little better than the vegans, interestingly. And uh, then the non-vegetarians are kind of up here. And in terms um, of, now those pesco vegetarian were they were they they were pesco ovo, so they were also fish yes. and a little bit of dairy too. Dairy, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and and so you know some of these differences, particularly in the cancers, um, made us look pretty carefully at dairy because one of the defining characteristics, of course, of being a vegan or a strict vegetarian is the absence of dairy. Now there are a number of other characteristics because you know the absence of dairy, people replace that by a whole bunch of other stuff, and so the vegans are eating more of fruit and vegetables and nuts and legumes and or grains as well. So you've got, we've always got to keep that in mind. Um, but when we look at the cancers, for instance, with respect to dairy, and we've looked at the three major cancers, um, colorectal, uh, we found that the red meat eaters were doing worse. No, nothing unexpected about that. That is now almost an established fact, particularly processed uh, red meats. Uh, however, we found that our dairy consumers were doing better with respect to colorectal cancer, and that also is uh, a fact that is considered almost established uh, from results from a number of different studies around the world, that um, dairy consumption seems to be associated with uh, a lower risk of colorectal cancer. Now, what component of dairy is important for that is a little less clear, 
And our data, it appeared to be the calcium, actually. Uh, when we looked even at non-dairy calcium, there seemed to be some relationship there. Uh, and, of course, one can get calcium in other ways apart from, from uh, dairy products. So that was interesting. We found there that dairy seemed to be somewhat protective. Maybe it's the calcium. Then we looked at um, uh, prostate cancer, and we had about 1,200 new prostate cancers um, in our uh, follow-up of about eight years. And there, somewhat to our shock, as I've mentioned already, we found that the dairy consumers were having a substantially increased risk. And when we put soy in there, it didn't really change that. And we put a whole bunch of other things in there and nothing much changed it. Whatever we uh, adjusted for known other risk factors of uh, prostate cancer and so forth. But it had a non-linear relationship. In other words, as you increased the uh, amount of dairy from even just a few teaspoons in your cup of coffee or something to half a cup to a cup, you found a rise in the risk of breast cancer of uh, about um, 35, and depending just how we looked at it, I think probably the more accurate figure is closer to 50%. Um, so the more you plus, consume, the higher risk. Well, only up to about a cup a day. Then the risk stays high, but it doesn't change much after that. So it's a non-linear relationship, which is pretty interesting. It's almost pharmacologic. Uh, you know, there's a lot of pills that you can swallow that – 10 milligrams a day is good, 20 milligrams is stronger, 30 might be strong, but above 30, nothing much changes. You know, 40 or 50, that's a common thing we find in the use of medications. And that seemed to be what's going on here, that there's some biochemical relationship that's being saturated, perhaps. Um, but no, there's a, yeah, here, it's, like we, saying, it's like saying there's a maximum uh, detriment <laughs> level. <laughs> Yeah, no, it appears that way. and It's not a very high level, right? It's a cup a day. Yeah, it's quite low. Actually, about two-thirds of a cup a day would seem to almost max. It didn't change a whole lot after that. Um, yeah. yeah, so quite low. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because the studies are a bit inconsistent. Other studies have found a positive relationship, but none have looked at the nonlinearity in the way that we did. And uh, most of them wouldn't have had the concentration of low dairy consumers that we have. I mean, we had a bunch of zeros, about 8,000 vegans. The uh, lacto ovos, about 30,000 of those, they, uh, despite having lacto in the name, were only consuming about 60% of the dairy as our non vegetarian adherents. Now, non vegetarian adherents were consuming dairy pretty much at the rate that non adherents consume. So we had this concentration of people at the low end that we can look at that much more carefully than many other studies. And the fascinating thing is that when we looked at breast cancer, again, to our surprise, we found exactly the same type of thing, even though these were all in the woman and the prostate cancers have been all in the men. So they were different people, actually. Um, so, so was it that, the same dose response, roughly, in terms of risk? Uh, approximately. I mean, it wasn't precisely the same, but it was very much the same idea. Yeah. So essentially, mm -hmm. about a cup a day of, of cow's milk is going to increase a woman's breast cancer risk by how much? Um, well, it's uh, it, it looked like it's between 35 and 50%. If we did the re regression calibration, I mentioned, which we think is more accurate, it was closer to 50 or even 60%. Now, you know, we need to be a little bit careful in talking about the increase. It's an, it's associated with an increase. Got it. Whether it is the causal factor, I would say needs a little bit more evidence, but certainly it's putting it under a big spotlight. And then in terms of prostate cancer, the association of increased risk, how much was that? Um, it was somewhat similar um, uh, in in the fifty percent range, or with the regression calibration, but more like twenty five percent um, with a more traditional. But either way, they were both highly statistically significant and likely to be due to chance. Mm -hmm. I remember when this information came out; it was very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. The uh, and I'm glad you 
put a little bit of clarity to it because it's like, well, dairy increases the risk of prostate cancer, and breast cancer, but it decreases your risk of colon cancer. It's like, what, what do I do? Right. <laughs> I'm a colon cancer survivor. You know what I mean? So I had, mm. you know, the wheels turning for sure. Like, huh, this is interesting, but the calcium, yeah, that calcium, um, connection is, is really fascinating. Uh, is there any more that you can say on that? I don't think so at this time. I mean, I think as we go forward, we need to uh, put more focus on exploring mechanisms. And that they would include perhaps um, sex steroids that may be of bovine origin. Um, dairy or or type, of, the type of dairy product? Like like so milk. The, yes, some some yes. people they they have milk in their tea or their coffee every day. Other people they yes. love cheese, so they're eating a lot of cheese. And other people maybe the only dairy they consume is butter. So like yes. you know, is there a difference? Yes. Uh, well, that's right. And you know, I can tell you a little bit about that in our data. We only were able to look at cheese and yogurt, but we found really no strong adverse signal there. They they appear to be different as compared to the milk, but we were also able to quite um, powerfully compare low-fat milk as compared to regular fat milk. And they found, again, absolutely no difference between the two. In other words, the strong positive signal was found in both. So it suggests that the whatever the adverse the uh, factor is, is not the fat. Uh, My hypothesis would be it would, that it's hormonal. Or maybe it's the no. casein. Maybe it's the casein yeah. or the hormones. Yeah. That's right. Or, or the or the protein, uh, which, as you know, uh, does raise IGF one. Although there's not perfect clarity on that study. A recent study from Oxford University looking at that was not able to find a strong signal between um, dairy and um, and IG, through IGF-1 to, to these cancers. But that's, that's not a published study. Yet. Yeah, that really is interesting to me. And, and I think it's important to point out for anybody watching, you know, that this is not a study conducted by an industry uh, with some type of bias, right? If there was a bias, if there was an inherent bias in this study, then they wouldn't, Dr. Frazier wouldn't be saying, hey, we didn't find a... Uh, a problem with cheese, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He would be saying, no, all the cheese is bad. All the, you know, the milk is bad. All the butter is bad. But I mean, he's just reporting their findings, which is that they didn't see a strong signal with cheese or yogurt, but they saw a strong signal with actually just drinking milk, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and I might point out along those lines that even though a number of our authors are vegetarian, none of us were vegan. Uh, none of us are vegan, although I must say that I no longer drink cow's milk. I do believe my own data. Yes, uh, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's good. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that is important. Thank you for mentioning that too, because it, it's not a wasn't it not a vegan agenda study, right? No, uh, there yeah, certainly not. there certainly have been vegan agenda studies. There certainly have been mm -hmm. a far more uh, meat agenda studies uh, published far, far more funded by the beef industry, the egg industry, dairy industry, things like that. So there's been a lot of those studies out there that are um, highly suspect, uh, just like the alcohol studies, you know, that uh, say alcohol uh, is good for cardiovascular health funded by the alcohol industry, <laughs> you know, that, that kind of thing. So you always got to be careful, got to be sort of wary about who's funding the study. Do they have a commercial interest agenda behind it? Obviously, pharmaceutical companies fund their own studies and they have uh, commercial interests to get drugs approved. So, okay. Uh, what else is worth mentioning? I know we just have a few more minutes and I want to be respectful of your time, Dr. Fraser. What else is worth mm -hmm. mentioning or what are the big takeaways you would say if, if we haven't touched on some already? Well, um, if I wanted to uh, summarize, I, I think that I would, do it like this, and it involves one point that we have not mentioned yet. Uh, we published about two years ago a paper where we looked at the impact of ultra-processed foods as compared to unprocessed foods, 
And we took about 45 different food groups and dug into that and for specific items, specific ways you can prepare fruit or uh, grains or whatever, categorized them into one of three categories, ultra-processed, partially processed, unprocessed, and then looked at the impact on mortality, adjusting for a whole bunch of other factors that might be related to to, to those items, and um, found that we could show about a 15% increase in mortality for diets that had 50 or 60% more of processed foods. Uh, as compared to diets that had, you know, less than 20% or so. Um, and uh, although this was the biggest study that had shown that there are other studies that point in the same direction. And uh, and interestingly, when we looked at this relationship amongst vegetarians separately and non-vegetarians, we found a sim- essentially identical results. So it points out that there's plenty of opportunity to have a bad vegetarian diet or, uh, you know, an excellent vegetarian diet. Um, And I'm not sure that this was the end-all study in terms of digging into that, but it's very clear that you can be a vegan and uh, still have a a poor diet if you're focusing mainly on uh, vegetarian pastries and pies and uh, sweet foods and, and, and so forth. Um, yeah, we, this is what we call junk food vegans. Exactly. Yeah. Junk food vegetarians. You can. There's a lot of fast food, processed food, and junk food you can eat that doesn't have any animal products in it. I mean, you can eat French fries, you can drink Diet Cokes, and eat you know Oreos. And there's right. no animal products in those foods, but those are ultra processed foods, <laughs> right? Right. Right. Yeah, so I, I think that I would summarize it, and uh, you know, one needs to make summaries simple, or else people won't remember them. Is to, uh, as far as possible, avoid animal foods. Um, if and having done that, to make sure that the proportion of processed foods that you have in your diet is relatively small. I don't think you need to go to the zero and and so forth. And there's a few riders to add to that, perhaps. Um, So I'm just talking about diet, of course. Some of the many other aspects to health, physical activity, sun exposure, and so forth. And that's the vitamin D thing. Um, And vegans do need to be a little bit careful in a couple of directions. One which is critical, I think, and that's the B12 supplementation. there's as you get older, particularly the intrinsic factor in your stomach doesn't work so well. So even lacto ovos that have a maybe a modest consumption of B12, I think many of them should supplement. And vegans definitely, uh, because the impact of B12 deficiency is um uh, you know very, very, very nasty and uh appears to be somewhat irreversible once you develop um, neurological problems, uh, even going back on the B12 does not help. Um, really? I didn't realize there was irreversible damage from uh, from prolonged yeah. B12 deficiency. Right. That's, that's really um, important to mention. And yeah. I should also mention that up to 40%, this is from one source or maybe a few corroborated studies, up to 40% of meat eaters have been found to be deficient in B12. Are, are yes. insufficient, right? Their, their levels are really not up to what they should be. So it is one of those vitamins that uh, arguably almost everyone should take. Yeah, particularly as you get older, the intrinsic factor in your stomach, which is necessary to absorb it, becomes less effective and uh, and, and you more likely to develop problems. So I think it's, it's avoiding animal products, avoiding too much ultra-processed foods, supplementing where necessary, and perhaps that includes uh, some uh, uh, non-animal sources of calcium, particularly if you have a history of colorectal uh, cancer. Um, uh, I think they're they're the main things to keep it simple. You can uh, obviously go beyond that, but that would take you quite a long way in the correct direction, I think. 
I, I love the simplicity. I, I'm all about simplicity. And when things get complicated, uh, people just, they won't do it. You know, the, everyone, we all need a simple plan to follow. And for me, yeah, it's eating a predominantly plant-based diet, whole food, plant-based diet, tons of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, herbs and spices, all this wonderful food that God made for us from the earth. This is the diet that I follow, the diet that I encourage everyone to adopt because it's wonderful. Uh, I do supplement D and B12, fresh air, sunshine, exercise, you know, great relationships, being social, you know, fellowship and, and, and friendship is so important for health and vitality and, and depression and loneliness really will send you down quickly, can really, really uh, put you in a downward spiral of health. And, uh, and so those things are, again, they're not complicated things. They're very simple things, but you have to focus your attention on them and you have to make them a priority in your life or else the default will just be junk food and sitting at home watching Netflix by yourself <laughs> and being lonely, especially if you're older and you live alone. Uh, so um, yeah, keeping the dairy to a minimum, uh, staying away from the processed food, keeping that to a minimum. You know, if you're going to eat that kind of stuff, make it an occasional treat. Don't make it part of your daily diet. Yeah, I couldn't have said it any better. Well, I'm so thankful for you, Dr. Fraser. Your your research is so incredible and so awesome. I love it. It gets me so excited. It's so informative and helpful. And I know it's not perfect, right? No, no science is perfect. No research study is perfect. But I think what you've done and what you're continuing to do is so valuable and, uh, it, and absolutely should be, should not be ignored. We should take it seriously because these are strong signals of, um, how our diet and lifestyle choices affect our health and our rates of chronic disease and cancer and death. And, uh, and it, it, I, I said this earlier, but in my opinion, these are the best kind of studies we have, right? They're not perfect, but they're the best kind we have where we're actually looking at the healthiest, longest living people and examining their, their lifestyle choices and drilling down into them and figuring out, okay, what are they doing right? <laughs> you know, what are they doing wrong? What are they doing right? And how can we incorporate that into our lives? So there's so much actionable information there that has come out of the work that you've done and you've just done a great service to humanity. And I, again, I just, I'm so thankful for you. I just want you to know that I want to just applaud you and, uh, and celebrate your work. And, and I want more people to know who Dr. Gary Fraser is. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Chris. And you're right. We always need to remember that science is a progressive endeavor. Well, uh, thank you so much again. Thank you everybody for watching. Please share this video, help us spread this message. Science is awesome. Science can teach us a lot of things and, uh, and nutritional science is really fun because then you actually have, when, when you study nutritional science, you get understanding and it helps motivate you to make better choices, right? <laughs> so when you see the impact that uh, good choices have on other people, it, it makes you wanna make them. Hopefully, at least it does me. But uh, anyway, that concludes today's interview. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.